Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming to um, the beginning of the second semester of the Diversified Farming Systems Roundtable. We're really glad you're here. And um, I just want to uh, call your attention to the events that we have coming up. Uh, you've been getting the flyers from, from Alby, so you probably know this already. But um, we're, we're sort of starting um, an interesting series of discussions this semester, which will include um, a lot of voices from growers themselves. Um, an example, of course, is today's panel. But I also want to mention next month's panel that Robin Marsh, uh, who's right there, is uh, organizing. And she's going to have uh, several growers, Thaddeus Barsotti from Farm Fresh to You and Tom Nelson from Full Belly Farm coming, uh, as well as um, Dave Runston from the Community, Community Alliance for Family Farmers. So I won't go over the whole list, but we've got some exciting things coming up. Um, Albie, can you advance to the next slide? Today, to stand up. Um, the title of our, our, our panel today is uh, Regional Grower Perspectives on Diversified Farming Systems, Costs, Benefits, and Obstacles. And we're really excited about this because uh, this is our opportunity to meet with um, a distinguished panel of growers uh, from California to really ask them and get the benefit of their expertise on the question of diversified farming systems. Uh, how are they utilizing some of these techniques in their own operations? Um, what are the obstacles to utilizing these techniques in their operations? What, um, uh, what would be the way of scaling up um, of, of getting these out, these, some of these techniques uh, and the benefits that they provide out to a broader group of growers. Uh, what sorts of research uh, would be beneficial to making this happen? Uh, and so those are the sorts of questions that we're going to be uh, asking them and hearing from them their perspectives. So just to give you a little bit of an idea of how the session will run today, um, each of our growers is going to, I'm going to introduce each one of them, and they're going to um, tell us a little bit about their farming operation, their farming philosophy. Some of them have some slides to share with you as well. Um, and then uh, once they've all had a, a chance to do that, um, I'll be asking them a series of questions um, along the themes that I just mentioned to you. Uh, and then after that, we'll open it up to you to ask questions, um, uh, which could be on the theme of diversified farming systems, but could also, of course, be off that theme, whatever you are interested in. Um, we'll, we'll hopefully have time to take a brief break and then regroup for further discussion. So that's basically how we're going to uh, run it today. So um, I think, Rob, you're going to start. So our first grower is Robert Goodwin, who's sitting right next to me. And um, he actually is uh, one of our own uh, UC Berkeley graduates. He graduated uh, which college were you in? Letters and Science. Letters and Science. Well, not CNR, but um, Letters and Science in 1981. Um, and then after that, he went on to get uh, his MBA at San Francisco State. Um, and so he, he comes with, to us with an interesting background of 30-plus uh, years of experience in the agricultural industry, um, beginning his career uh, working for uh, the startup team of Tanimura, Tanimura and Antle, which is now the leading worldwide independent producer of fresh vegetables. After that, he went to get his uh, MBA and spent 10 years in the technology industry before returning to agriculture in 1995. Um, and uh, subsequently, he founded the Cooper Land Corporation, which manages prime agricultural ranches in the Blanco region of the Salinas Valley. Um, and in 2003, he developed a consulting program uh, for sustainable farming systems. Um, and in, I'm kind of abstracting from his uh, bio, in 2009, he became a founding partner in Miragios, which delivers sustainability analytics and solutions for the agricultural markets in the emerging, in the emerging low carbon economy. And he is from a, he is the seventh generation of a California farming family in that region. So he's going to uh, show us, I think, some old maps of that. Right. Yeah. So. 
Well, good. Well, thank you, Claire. And uh, I want to thank the uh, Berkeley Institute of the Environment for putting together this round table. I've been to uh, several of these, and I, I consider it to be a, a tremendous collaboration of uh, researchers and uh, um, industry personnel and uh, uh, government uh, 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 vested stakeholders. So that being said, uh, Alvi, could you bring up the map of the, all right, I'm going to, this is a, this is basically the land, I've managed some of this land. This is a 6,000 acre ranch, which was land granted to my great grandfather in, uh, uh, this was grant, uh, land granted in, uh, uh, in the 1860s, he purchased it in 1823. And what's interesting about it is, is how it's laid out. You have the Salinas River to the southwest. Uh, it's uh, the Monterey Bay to the west. The, the northeast is Rolling Hills, the Morro Coa Slough. And you can see where these, these uh, uh, sloughs and, and, and waterways are down here to the to the southeastern border of the, the uh, ranch, 6,000 acres. Uh, I currently manage 2,000 of that 6,000 acres. And my view is this, I look at this, the, the natural topography, I look, this is an ecosystem. Um, and, and it's farmed, uh, now if you could go to the 2009 slide, you'll see how, it, how it's been broken up. Um, Castorville, Salinas is over here. These are all farming units uh, in here. Uh, actually, Dave's on several of these uh, units. And uh, so the, the challenge is, is how we manage this ecosystem in, in the farming environments and, and, uh, and move forward to maintain the integrity of the land. Now, you know, clearly it's different than it was 150 years ago. But you know the water, the water's there, still there to some degree. We've put in a tertiary water treatment facility, so we no, no longer pump groundwater. But we have water, and we have tremendous alluvial soils uh, here, um, uh, which which should be a, 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 a great growing environment for many years to come. So how do we go about doing this? Well. Agriculture, everybody has a perspective on it, and, and they're all, it's all different. But I view it as a collaboration between uh, uh, vested stakeholders. Uh, and y y without getting to, to, to every, everyone from the, the person who puts the seed into the ground to the consumer has the food on the table, has a vested interest in agriculture. That's why our food system has become such a, an important uh, uh, issue of the day, and it, and it will be um, as uh, as uh, the as a, as a consumer becomes more more uh, connected to to what they're eating, and I think that's a movement that we're seeing. Uh, I I spent last week down at Echo Farm, which is primarily organic. Uh, farmers who represent about 3% of the industry, and the other 97% fa falls into the conventional side. But uh, you, you can't break agriculture up into the, a black and white like that. You got to view it more of a, as a continuum. And uh, this land is 90% uh, conventionally farmed, but uh, that doesn't preclude it from being sustainably farmed. And that's where this roundtable becomes particularly important because uh, the research related to biodiversity uh, indicates uh, that uh, through uh, various techniques, we can optimize this ecosystem, if you will, and derive ecosystem benefits as well as continue to generate uh, uh, valuable food uh, commodities. Um, for for uh, for um, the consumer. So um, that being said, I'm going to pass this on to our next speaker. Okay, let me just. Uh, I guess it's going to be Tom Powers. So let me just introduce him. Um, so Tom operates a 58-acre sustainable family farm nearby in western Contra Costa County. Uh, it's the Alhambra Valley Ranch. 
Uh, Alhambra Valley itself was once filled with orchards and wine grapes before prohibition um, and was farmed by several well-known farmers such as John Muir and John Sweat. I didn't know that. It's interesting. Um, Tom has revived the historic grape growing and winemaking tradition by starting a winery on his farm in 2005. Uh, he's been many things. This is his, what he calls his fourth or fifth career, but is from a long line of farmers, including his grandfather, who was one of the first farmers in the Imperial Valley in 1910. Uh, Tom was awarded Contra Costa Sus County's Sustainable Farming Individual of the Year in 2009, and he chairs the Brentwood Agricultural Land Trust Board and the Contra Costa County Agricultural Advisory Board. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Um, thanks for letting me be here. Um, I'm, compared to these farmers, I'm just a gardener uh, because uh, these people are really uh, involved in massive farming and my operation is very small. Uh, I started it in 1998 um, knowing that the Alhambra Valley was a once a very nice growing area for grapes before 1919. And then uh, subsequent to that, uh, I learned from some of my uh, neighbors that in the 40s and 50s, tomatoes were a big product here prior to uh, the time that the canneries closed in Richmond. So uh, I got into this uh, farming operation kind of out of romance rather than out of uh, to, to uh, to make a living, but I found that I need to make a living out of it now because it's pretty consuming. So uh, I started with grapes uh, because I knew those grew in the area, and we have uh, our ranch is uh, is is hilly, has uh, three different types of soil, so uh, you have to be very careful about what you plant, uh, also and uh, how you plant it. Uh, so I started with grapes and then uh, began selling those grapes to uh, local uh, winemakers, home winemakers mostly. And uh, then I got into olives because the olives uh, were another product that grew in this area. Finally, just out of uh, curiosity and out of demand from some of my neighbors, I began planting vegetables, mostly tomatoes and other uh, non-leafy uh, vegetables. I didn't want to get into the issues that uh, we, we were talking about earlier about the regulatory process that comes with uh, uh, leafy vegetables. So um, my farm is diverse because of the soil and because of the, uh, the type of soil and also because of the hills uh, that I have. So I use the, I have two big hills. I use those as pastures. I first got into the uh, goat and sheep business by rescuing or uh, getting retired farm animals. And uh, now it's turned into a, a business uh, just by itself because these the goats and sheep reproduce so fast that I've got to get rid of them. So uh, it's, it's becoming a, um, another profit center. And so my diversity comes as a result of uh, the, the kind of land that I'm in and also the kind of customers. My customers are very close to my ranch. We have a produce stand. We have a small winery we just started. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, when I present um, my neighbors uh, tomatoes, uh, they say, well, have you ever tried the Cherokee purple tomato? And so I began planting Cherokee purple tomatoes and they're very good. <laughs> uh, so the demand for diversity was from my customers and because of the land. Um, and uh, I'm still experimenting with this and I learn something every day, even though my family have been farmers as far as I can, uh, um, since the 1600s. Uh, so uh, I stepped out of it for a while, but now I'm back. and. Uh, it's, a, it's quite a challenge, but my market is, is very different than large producers. My market is face-to-face -face with uh, neighbors and with stores in the vicinity of uh, my uh, farm. So uh, there you have it. Thank you, Tom. So um, our next speaker will be Dale Koch. And Dale um, is uh, unusual in our panel of growers in that he doesn't come from a long line of farmers. Um, Instead, uh, 
he, uh, he really just uh, took to this himself. And in 1981, uh, he started literally in his own backyard growing a quarter acre of organic strawberries in Monterey County. Now that's expanded to 500 acres uh, that he farms in Monterey and San Benito, including uh, fruits and vegetables. And Dale. Uh, hello, thanks for having, having us here, having me here. Um, the, there's a little bit of a misnomer on the, um, the connection to agriculture anyway. The, there has been no direct connection in the family, you know, that you could look to as uh, handing down a farm or, or practices, but uh, I think most, almost all the generations have engaged in farming. Uh, my father, after he uh, had a career in, you know, at San Jose State as a professor, and, and then be, is still farming now, um, but the, uh, there was no, no real um, passage of knowledge or land, so I ended up with, um, you know, kind of maybe a, an optimistic idea of, about uh, trying to do something with organically, and uh, I was goaded by the, the conventional neighbor who told me that you could not grow strawberries organically. So that was um, a bit of a challenge. So it turned out you could, and um, there was good response. I don't know that we, we got the same yields that he did, but the um, people enjoy it. They like the flavor. And so we, it was fortuitous. It was in the early 80s, and we were able to expand um, uh, at the time with the help of um, marketing, especially vegetables, uh, to, re to restaurants. And this was just being in the right place at the right time, I guess. And um, we kind of grew the, um, Chez Panisse was one of the first um, customers for the strawberries. Uh, and then uh, there's a woman who was very instrumental in, in uh, making a farm to restaurant connection happen. And we were able to um, do that, uh, Sabella. Uh, uh, with the, um, even though it was organic the whole time, the, the farm expanded from the fact that the California cuisine was happening and we ended up uh, having all these different kinds of greens and lettuces that uh, we could sell to restaurants, but we couldn't sell a whole lot to them. It was often plate decorations or, you know, they were kind of interested, but you'd have a lot of leftovers in the field. And we started, uh, well, Maybe we could cut these and mix them together and we put them in a box that was a uh, box we are using for uh, squash. <laughs> and it happened to fit three pounds and so we started this spring mix deal in the early 80s and that kind of a pack. And that ended up having a lot of, uh, this is a salad mix, pre-cut. You know, we uh, used a, I had a, a washing machine, I hate to admit this, but um, <laughs> so a washing machine that um, I took the top off, put it on permanent spin cycle and <laughs> wire baskets and um, fiberglass tubs. I mean, it was clean and we fed it to the kids all the time. So, um, but it, it wouldn't pass muster these days, um, but it was, it did expand um, the market and we were able to grow from you know, that little bit, it was a 10 acre ranch we started with and a little bit of strawberries. And we could end up buying a place uh, up the hill that was close, another 30 acres, and then moved into um, uh, some other ranches and was able to buy a place in San Juan Batista that was a 200 acre ranch in 1989. And kind of following that, the demand and the sales, it was uh, one of those times where there was you know, there's a lot of demand and not, not enough product, so. Uh, currently, that we did that until the people that have more experience with farming um, figured out that they could do it a lot cheaper and, and more efficiently than we could because we were cutting by hand and after a while they figured out you can use, you know, these bandsaw blades and wide beds and, you know, precision planting and, 
it, it was hard to um, be competitive with that. So in the late 90s, we got out of that. And 99 was the last year we were, financially, it was, it was getting tough. Um, food safety things were starting to come down. Um, and we decided to pretty much, you know, get out of that market. And I actually quit farming. Um, took some art classes and goofed around and did that for three years. And, and then my uh, sister and wife were doing mo the bulk of the, the work on sales. We were shipping out of different coolers in the Salinas area. And then it was too much for my sister, so I had to buy her out and ended up um, getting back in it. And now I'm kind of, um, it's got a whole new life, but we're not doing the salad mix, but we're continuing. Now there's uh, more demand for organic production. We've been able to um, bring on some other growers, so we, sh we um, sell for some smaller growers that kind of round out the crop mix, and we might have 30, 30 growers over the course of the year that we will uh, bring their product into our uh, cooling facility and pre-cool the product and put it into storage, and then we sell it. We take a commission and, um, and remit the rest to them. They ship in their own boxes. Um, and we ship across the country, uh, year-round operation, we're going into Canada. Uh, and it's got, we cover just about all the vegetables now. Some of it we grow ourselves with a separate farming company. It's not Coke Farm, but uh, Hardinus is the name of it. And I think it gives you, we're, we're, we ran, run on, uh, the farming company runs on f about seven different ranches, and most of them have some biodiversity on them by virtue of uh, either hedgerows or um, intentionally planted areas. Uh, we try to keep swales grassed so that we don't have issues with water runoff, uh, with sediment leaving the, the ranches. Um, I think that's probably enough for right now. So our, our last presenter is David Martella, who um, is from a fifth generation, is a fifth generation of, a, of, of farmers um, in the US. Um, but he himself was, actually grew up in a city and wasn't planning to become a farmer um, until he uh, started working for his uncle and really worked his way up from the bottom of the food chain on the farm. I forgot what you said, you laying pipe and things well, like that. Pipe. Sprinkler pipe. Oh, weeds. Weeds, things like that. Um, <clears throat> But anyway, that uh, he he ended up uh, deciding to go into farming, and so here we have him. Thank you, thank you uh, for having me here. Um, she said, "I'm fifth generation. Uh, my family came to what was Monterey County then, was all of Santa Cruz County and all of San Benito in 1860s, and uh, they came as potato farmers from Scotland. And the other side of the family came in the 1880s." They were alpine dairymen from Switzerland, and, and so that background started it. Uh, and uh, I originally went to college to become an accountant and uh, decided I couldn't work in a cubicle somewhere and uh, had to get an education or else I was going to move sprinkler pipe for the rest of my life, and that gets old very fast. But uh, So I worked for my uncle 14 years, essentially uh, on-the-job training learning how to farm. It all started uh, when I was 19. And so I learned efficiencies of, of the ranch, you know, what worked, what didn't work, why he did things, why he changed things from what my grandfather had done, and technology as it changed and as we uh, absorbed that. And, uh, and then I had an opportunity to go to work uh, for a larger company, uh, Gene Jackson Farms, which was a subsidiary of A. Duda and Sons from Florida, which at the time was the largest family-owned farming company in America. They farmed about 110,000 acres in 10 states. And I worked for them as a location manager in charge of production for uh, Central Coast, Salinas, Monterey, uh, and also Huron in the Central Valley. Uh, and it was a total of about 5,000 acres of crop. Decisions on uh, seed varieties, growing techniques, working with, it was all working with uh, grower partners. And so it was all a collaboration. I learned more 
as I went along. I learned the sales and marketing end of the business uh, from that employment. And then I was given an opportunity in 1997 to set up my own farming company. Um, started out with uh, 600 acres, which was uh, roughly 1,100 crop acres in 1997 for Tanamara and Annal. And uh, currently I grow uh, 1,500 crop acres on 806 acres of, of ground. We get almost two crops uh, for every land acre. Uh, a lot of it in this map, I essentially farm uh, from the city of Salinas uh, out to uh, just about Highway 1, about a mile away. Uh, five of the ranches uh, belong to uh, Robert's family. I have three other landlords also. It's all leased ground. My family, my uncle still farms. Uh, he's 68. He's going to retire in two years, he told me. But So he's uh, the family ground that we, we own, have owned for... Uh, 80 years is still farmed by family members. And so all the ground that I farm for Tanimer and Annal in a partnership uh, is leased. And uh, very expensive right now for someone 30 years old, even my age at 50, to go out and buy farmland in this area. Uh, it's $50,000 an acre purchase, undeveloped uh, annual rent, Twenty-six, twenty-seven hundred dollars a year, which is the equivalent of going to Fresno County and buying ground on an annual basis. But it's all environment. Um, this area is some of the mildest climate that you'll see in the world, and that's why the commodities that I grow, I grow seven commodities at this point, lettuce, leaf lettuce, romaine, broccoli, cauliflower, celery, and uh, broca flower occasionally, uh, green cauliflower. But it, it was called the salad bowl of the world because between the 40s and the 70s, 95% of all lettuce came out of that area. And it had to do with the climate. Our summertime low is maybe 45 degrees. Daytime high in that would be 68, more than 90% of the time. So it's the mildest growing curve that you see. And that goes to you know, the other thing uh, as far as inputs, why it was so desirable, is that water use is a third. If you go 30 miles south of where I farm, they use three times as much water for the same crop. And if you go 20 miles more, they're using four times. So at a time when water wasn't really an issue, it has become more of an issue now, and so it goes into the philosophies of can you still be a conventional grower and be diversified farming or use practices? And we do. Uh, you know, it's the best use of water, of resources. Uh, a lot of what we do, crop rotation, which is not new to me, it goes back, but, you know, rotating crops, uh, brassicas and lettuces uh, for disease suppression, so a lot of the same principles apply uh, to everything that goes across. And so where we would like to use things, we're not able to due to uh, regulation at this point. Um, things that were being used before have been taken out of use, such as grassy waterways, uh, buffering areas. Um, that's water quality versus food safety. And so, the government end of it has become much tougher in the last five, six years and continues to go that way. Um, and it's hard to comply, to have mandated change without really scientific data to back the change. And so a lot of that gets pushed our way right now. And uh, I guess that's it. OK, great. Thank you. So I'm sure we'll come back to those food safety issues. Um, can we just advance a couple slides, Albie? I, before we get into the questions, I just I want to remind the audience as well as uh, the panel of our very broad uh, description of diversified farming systems. Um, where's that? So this is a slide. No, I turned it off. Sorry. 
This is a slide uh, that you've seen before if you were here at one of the, some of the earlier um, uh, panels that we've had, some of the earlier presentations. And it's just sort of uh, my rendition of uh, what do we mean by diversified farming systems. Uh, so from, from an ecological scale, we can mean diversity at many different levels, uh, from the genetic level, as in crop varieties, through to the species level, different types of crops, bringing those together in a, a sort of uh, agroecosystem and up to the landscape scale. And uh, from a spatial perspective, we could be talking about diversity within a field, uh, so at the plot scale, diversity at the whole field scale or around the field, and then diverse, diversity at the landscape scale. Uh, and then the bottom panel is just uh, to mention some of the types of um, uh, me methods on, in farming that can produce this diversity, at, and they're coded to the different spatial scales. So everything from intercropping to multiple crops and varieties, uh, uh, diversity not only over space, but also over, over time through crop rotations and cover crops, integrating livestock that might range widely over the fields, um, and then thinking at the landscape scale with crop borders like hedgerows and riparian buffers, the grassy swales, woodlots, et cetera. So this is just to get us all back on the same page with uh, what we mean by diversified farming systems. And now uh, what I'd like to do is, um, is, is start asking the growers a series of questions. And if you can go on to the next slide, Albie. Um, the first question is, um, what factors encourage you to begin adopting diversified farming practices on your own farm? Hopefully that's what it says up there. Yes. Um, so, um, and, and just for the panelists, uh, if you didn't actually already mention which of these practices you are using, maybe you could start by that, you know, which practices you're using, and then, and then what, why are you using those? What's, what's good about them? Um, what are they doing for you and your farm? And um, you know, please feel free to answer the question in any order or not answer it if you like, but, or expand on it. Well, I'll start since I'm the smallest. Um, okay. I, uh, I, used, uh, I used most of the practices that are identified there. Um, and uh, the, uh, the reason, uh, several in, in nature, one is the, uh, the type of soils I have call for different kinds of crops. Uh, I also have different configurations, uh, hills and, and r rolling hills. Um, also, there are some issues related to uh, um, controlling pests. Uh, for instance, I, uh, uh, I have a hedgerow around one side of my uh, farm. We've, we've had a bee problem in the area. Uh, we have natural bees, but uh, bees that have been brought in have had some problems, and uh, so I'm trying to encourage uh, the growth of these uh, hedgerows in order to encourage more bees, and also other insects that are predators to uh, bad insects that we have. Um, um, I think a lot of the diversity that came uh, in my ranch came because of uh, customer demand as well as the soil and the configuration. Um, since our market is really just the very small area around the farm, uh, and I, I mean a few stores and a few towns, and uh, our produce stand that we operate during the summer, which we hope to expand, um, the diversity comes from my customers who say we'd like to have a certain type of product and. So I find out if I'm capable of handling it and growing it uh, uh, economically, and and so that's a part of the diversity. Uh, it uh, this is a a small farm like this is really uh, experimental, and uh, because uh, of the nature of the area, uh, we also have water issues. The last three years we've uh, had a drought. Uh, in the beginning of uh, the uh, time when I uh, purchased this ranch, uh, there was water in one field only five feet down at the driest time of the year. So we French drained that field, created a pond, and pumped the water into the pond, which I used for irrigation. Um, 
And that, uh, the kind of water, the, the amount of water dictates some of the kind of crops that I can grow or and can't grow as well. So, um, I'd like to add that uh, economic factors are also uh, uh, an important um, uh, to the concept of diversity. If you have uh, multiple crops and you've spread spread your your bets, if you will, you have. Uh, you have, you're, you're more economically viable and you're, you're, you're uh, taking less risk. Uh, and um, the potential, if you're all in one crop and market factors or environmental factors should uh, 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 take away the, the value of that crop, well then you're, you have a lot of exposure. So um, economics does drive uh, a lot of uh, with the sustainability um, um, uh, initiatives, so. That, that's a good point, I just wanna throw something in. I found that uh, Roma tomatoes are not economical because they're, we do everything by hand and they're so small. You don't get very many. <laughs> that, that's a very practical thing. On the other side of the coin, these great big um, Cherokee purple tomatoes, you, you can barely get your hand around some of them. <laughs> and they're much more economical, obviously. Excuse me for interrupting. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of the factors that, that we, it's economic is a large one, uh, into what I can contract to grow on the, on the land available profitably. Um, that's dictated by a grower part, partner. They have to be able to sell what I'm growing at the same point and meet that. Um, you know, rotational uh, crop rotations and stuff are economic based also. If you continue to mine y your asset, the soil, um, you're gonna, it, it's kind of like the South in the, in the 1800s, you know, you can't plant cotton all day long and, and not rotate it. You lose the viability of the soil, so you diminish your asset. And so crop rotation leads into that, which leads into less disease pressure um, and uh, less mining of the soil because certain crops use certain minerals, certain don't. And so you're replenishing and taking and replenishing. Um, and one of the things that we'd like to, you know, go back to that we had, which were, you know, grassy waterways and, and some buffers, wind buffers aren't available due to food safety concerns anymore and contractual obligations and how produce is uh, grown in today's environment uh, of food safety. And so those were practices that had been in place uh, for a long time that essentially have gone away in the last four years, five years. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand that the, um, we, as organic growers, the, the um, rotation is really important to be able to um, break the cycle. You know, you don't have a lot of materials you can use, so we try to make it as diverse as possible. Um, we, we have to be able to sell it, but um, and we, so some of the determinations are, you know, crops that we seem to be able to grow well, and then a rotation of those crops so that uh, we're, we're you know, making it, uh, g giving ourselves a better chance. There are some um, pests that, w you know, we have, uh, we can't deal with very well, but um, we, the, the diversity seems to help economically and uh, practically as, as a growing. Um, so we were, in, yeah, it's kind of part of the <coughs> mantra of that uh, organic is, diversified cropping. But. Well, I think um, to some extent, uh, David, you, you've anticipated the next question, which is, um, but I, th I don't think we should limit it to the food safety issue, but that's one of them. What are, what are the uh, principal obstacles to diversifying agriculture for the cropping systems that you're most familiar with, that the food safety ones, one you already brought up, but I think there probably are others as well. Um, 
and again, when we say diversifying agriculture, we could be talking about um, diversifying right within a field. I don't know how difficult it is to diversify right within a field. Um, you know, I think that a lot of the organic growers do do that, but there probably are some limits to that. Um, and uh, a sort of subtext of that is how might these obstacles differ among farms of different size? A very small farm perhaps can do this much more effectively than a large farm. What are, what are sort of the barriers um, to diversifying agriculture? And also, we should consider these other aspects of diversification, as as in putting in these um, non uh, non commodity elements of tailwater ponds or hedgerows or any of those things. Well, uh, diversity. Uh, uh, my farm. One thing that prevents some of the diversity is that I have hills that 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 do uh, have uh, soil that that if I didn't care for that soil properly would wash down into the, the creeks. And so I have to have uh, grassy swells and I have to uh, account for that. And, and as a result of that, I, well, also the weather, I, I probably couldn't grow leafy greens that well. I, my, my farm's too hot. For, uh, the Salinas Valley is just the most ideal place for growing leafy greens anywhere in the world probably. Uh, but I, so I'm limited in some respects by uh, both from food safety standpoint and from a weather standpoint of going into certain kind of crops. That's just one shot. Yeah, I mean, we, I would like to be able to incorporate animals, you know, in some, in some thought, you know. I, I mean, and, and part of that is an, um, the inability to do that is economic, I suppose. Um, because part of the land we own, part we rent, um, a certain value of the land, I guess. Uh, I keep thinking, I'll, you know, someday I might be able to figure out how to do it, uh, and then also deal with the food safety issues, which might require a multi-year rotation out of um, animals. Uh, but that I'd like to be able to do grains and uh, you know, beans. Uh, I try that, um, but it, you know, I, I can do that on a limited extent on the ground that, um, in one case that I, I rent a ranch uh, um, just so I can get the water rights from it because I don't have enough water that comes in from the district water, which is water that comes down th from Shasta through the Sacramento Delta and then into to ours. And so if you have more land then you you have a a bigger base and you can you, you can move whatever water there is to the ranch to use that um, so I can I can kind of fool around with uh, a grain crop you know it's a couple of years ago commodity prices were starting to get high enough that it looked like we could be we might be able to be competitive at least organically for grains in locally um, and that was when fuel prices were going through the roof too. So, um, yeah, there, it, uh, yeah, we haven't figured that out, but I'd I'd like to. But I think it's economic, and um, uh, that's as far as the animals and the grain part for me. Maybe I could just um, maybe broaden the question out a little bit and say. If you were thinking perhaps not even of your own farm, but of, of other people who have not yet adopted any uh, techniques, or maybe there aren't such people, but um, I, I think of, convention, of, of quite a few conventional growers as really, perhaps they, they do have some crop rotation in their system, but might not be using a lot of these techniques that you guys are all using. What would be the barriers for them for adopting these techniques? That's, I think, one of the questions this group is really interested in. Um, my experience is mostly up in Yolo County, which is a little bit different. I mean, it's very hot. Um, there's a lot of processing tomato. There's a lot of sunflower. There's a lot of uh, wheat and safflower. Um, so the big growers, that's what they're growing. Um, and they definitely do a rotation, sort of the UC Davis rotation. But they don't, most of them are not doing these other kinds of techniques. A few are starting to. Um, but I think that there's also, I mean, down in Salinas Valley, there's a lot of growers that have huge fields of 
the salad greens as well that maybe aren't necessarily using these techniques. What would be, what, what prevents them? You find value in it. What, what, what are the obstacles to overcome? Personal preference. I mean, in, in the map that Rob showed you of those farming entities, there, in that 6,000 acre area, there's probably 45 or 50 at least different farming entities. Everyone's technique is their own. And so, yeah, you kind of look at what your neighbor's doing and say maybe that will work, but it comes down to people's personal preference. And you go to grassy waterways, grassy or, or hedgerows have to be maintained. There's an economic cost to that. And when everything is squeezed down to you know, Walmart pricing, essentially. You know, everyone is jumping out of the boat to get a Walmart contract because it's year-round. It's supposed to be a fair deal, but everyone's just that little bit different. So do you pay your workers health insurance or don't you? If it's the difference of saving $50 an acre, I know that we ha I have health insurance for permanent employees, 11 full year-round employees. And I only know two other companies that farm around me that do the same thing. So there's an economic advantage already of 50 or $60 an acre that I'm absorbing because it's the right thing to do, yeah. it, the yeah. social conscious part of it. Yeah. And so to the most part, what, what I have to justify every part of that is can I afford on a 200 acre ranch to take 20 acres out of production and rotate a grain or something else in it and have the rest of the crops absorb that cost. Maybe in the Central Valley at $200 an acre rent, you could, and cheap water, which they've had until the last couple of years. But at $2,500 an acre, you can't absorb that. And so you, it's the difference of being in business or being employed for someone else. And so it really comes in my operation and what I see around, especially where we're, I pay the highest rent in the Salinas Valley and the people that are around me are paying the highest rent in that area. And there's reasons for it. We have lower costs in other areas. But it really be, comes down to how much can you absorb into it to make it beneficial and cost effective. You have to be caught. It's not good enough to just be a good farmer. You Albie, could you bring up the Walmart merchandising? Uh, uh, I think it uh, might be I'm, forward, yeah. Before. There you go. There we are. Um, this, I, I, this is Walmart's, uh, this, this is Walmart's, uh, how they break out the merchandising. That 49% you see grocery, that's a lot of buying power. And 80% of what happens in our area, the Salinas Valley, goes to Walmart, Costco, Super Value. You know, there's only a handful. And they're really setting the parameters for what we can and cannot do because they've driven the costs to the point where the margins are so, so thin that introducing... Um, um, new crops and things like that is a risky business and because um, uh, you have to find a buyer for it and you have to go outside of this supply chain typically and uh, um, to give you an example I've uh, this is a real-world case study that's happening now in the artichoke industry artichokes have been uh, very depressed uh, because of the um, economy. It's a, it's a luxury item within the produce section. So we're looking at 450 acres of artichoke ground that where we have to look at uh, alternative crops. And so how, you know, when you look at that 450 acres, you just don't flip a switch and have new crops out there. You have to develop a transition plan and so we're, we've developed a plan that, that over the next um, five to eight years to fa phase in some new crops on a, on, on a percentage of that land. And then so we have to work within the framework of, of 
the existing um, economic environment related to artichokes because you just don't pull out 450 acres of plants overnight. And then talk to Dale about uh, doing some transition work for us and uh, you know, uh, uh, some, I'm not gonna say organic crops because it takes three years to get that certification before you, you can label something organic, but there is that middle ground related to sustainability. Um, so, so you, but you, you bite off what you can chew there. You don't, uh, you don't, you, you don't uh, shoot yourself in the foot by, by overextending yourself. So, you know, one of the things that when I look at the um, barriers to you know more diversity, um, aside from the economic, the, uh, the scale has something to do with it. The uh, philosophy of the. Um, uh, the, the farming entity, uh, some just, um, if they don't have to, they won't. There's no incentive to change. You know, it's easier to do, to grow one crop um, if you could, I mean, you could get good at it and you could just grow that one thing, you wouldn't have, I mean, some people might find it boring, but it's, <laughs> you could, um, you know, if you weren't having problems, you specialize in it, you know it, it's not like, there's enough vagaries in farming anyway. Um, it's the smaller growers normally diversify because their uh, marketing is diversified. So you know they're f selling to farmers markets or us. You know we're selling to m people that are picking up mixed pallets of things. We, it fits for us, but it if you're selling through the larger scale that and they basically just want iceberg or cauliflower, then it doesn't you. And you'd like to do them in as big a block as possible. You can reduce your cost if you can um, grow it that way. Uh, so, th and then the other thing that landowners want to get a, a good rate of return on their in, on their land. So the prices for the rent are are, are uh, impact the grower's decisions. If uh, if the grower was getting land for two hundred dollars an acre, he and he had some incentive to diversify, he might. But if he, if it's all, you know, trying to make sure he's got enough money, you know, the whole thing is there's, well, I'm not sure, maybe um, you could talk to the, you know, how much of it is contracted. You know that kind of the amount that you're growing, but whether or not they're, they put any, they give you a bottom, a price on? Yeah. They do. So on the 1,500 acre, just dollars, gross dollars on the farm end, uh, nearly seven million dollars gross cost to produce. Uh, one and three quarter million dollars in equipment that is increasing, decreasing um, as things wear out, and they wear out. You you wouldn't think that a quarter of a million dollar tractor wears out in four years, but they do. It's just like the car you drive. It, it's no different than that. Maybe you can get eight or nine years out of some things. But if you're driving 50,000 miles a year, you're not gonna get eight years on a car. And it's the same thing with farm equipment. So the, that cost goes in. That's all predicated to a larger size. You, you can do uh, smaller size, less equipment, but more intensive. So you have more hand labor involved in that. Um, I don't do any harvesting. That's the shipper that I contract. So my entire crop is contracted out at a, at a value. And then he, in turn, is contracting to the big five, Walmart, Kroger, AP, Costco. And so I would say overall, for the company I grow for, maybe 65% of the crop is contracted at this point. And contracting is good and bad. Yeah, you make more money in a down market, it also prevents you because there's lids on the contracts. They don't escalate very well. And so in a period of windfall profits where you have less production, so you're not gonna meet your cost numbers, your ability to recover is limited because now you've limited yourself in the marketplace. And so if you had the same production numbers, 1,000 cartons an acre in a $15 market, everyone would make money every day. But the market is typically nine bucks, which is $2 under production cost. 
And so what you look is for the spikes, the weather events, the pestilence problem, whatever, that takes yields down to 700 or 800 so that the market elevates because supply or demand exceeds. And so there's more. But what happens is you don't have the production to take advantage of that. And so it's just, it's the whole downward squeeze. And it did it to all the commodity markets. If you look at all the food grains, between hedging your crop and what you actually get, it's down to where, you know, a person can't make a living in Iowa unless they farm 5,000 acres because the profitability isn't there. And then if you have a dry year or an overweight year, now it's all you can do to meet your contract obligations and make money. And so it's the same thing here, is the economic of being bigger, smaller, and having that diversity limits what you can do, what they can sell, at what point. And so, you know, in my world, I think it's all, it should all be there. There should be organic. That philosophy is no better than mine. It's just a different one. And it should be inclusive to the point. But to force ideals into an economic environment, you know, things get pushed out. And so you, you want certain things. You want social equality. You want good wages for farm workers that are taken care of. But you still want $1 a loaf bread. So it's all there. You can't, can't have it all. And that goes to the overall economic of, we, we spend 10% of our disposable income on food. Europe, our closest equal, spends 18 to 22%. That, that's, and a lot of that is uh, you know, obstacles, government regulation. Government policy in this country since the depression has been cheap food at all costs. Yeah. Milk and bread, $3 a gallon milk, $2 a loaf bread. And, and that is driven through the farm bill and that, those kind of subsidies. Right. But that's not to say that Europe doesn't do the same thing. Yeah. They protect their farmers at the same time and not in the marketplace. Good. But I think that they the, don't. Uh, yeah. off. I'd like to ask some questions. Um, We'll, we'll go off format a little bit. And Robin, you want to ask him? Just as a follow-up. Oh. So just as an energy, I have to, you know, um, politely disagree that organic is better. And <laughs> <laughs> um, I, well, that goes a little to this. Uh, but. So it seems uh, that Rob was saying that, in fact, diversification, it, there's a lot of economic rationale in terms of spreading risk or reducing risk, climatic and pest risk and so on and so forth. And so there was an economic rationale. But then when we get to looking at the big markets, the Walmarts, it's squeezing to the bottom. And you're in some ways contesting that, David. So my question is, if, in fact, on the cost side, it's very difficult to 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 justify diversification in a place like Salinas Valley with those high land rents. Could you explore again the price size? This whole thing about 10% of the disposable income going to food, double that in Europe. That's where I see our future going a lot in terms of incentives for diversification and sustainability is on the consumers, the taxpayers, the 98% of the population that aren't farmers paying a little bit more and providing that incentive, and whether it's within Walmart, or it's in your CSAs, or it's in your other alternative supermarkets, that's where I see the hope for a more sustainable farming system where you can still make a profit. And I'd like you to comment on that. Well, you know, just my perspective and where, where I see it, Walmart is about 50% of the total buying power in vegetables now. They went from 10 years ago being about 5% to the giant that they are. Their number one f philosophy is cheap as we can do it. That's what they tell their customers every day. It's cheap as we can get it. And so that's their philosophy and that's what we're up against. And, and so you're looking at a, I don't know, a $20 billion company 
And I would think on the largest size, we're looking at maybe a $200 million company in ag production. You know, there's a bunch of companies in that range. There's just a power, power play that is there being the biggest gorilla in the room. And so it goes to that. Is it, does it prevent diversity? No, because that goes to the viability of, of how you're going to continue to produce, whether it, if it's nothing more than crop rotation in the ground that you're doing. I grow lettuce really well, and it would make life a whole lot easier if that's all I grew. But I could only maybe do it for four years. And that would push the soil to the end. And so if you don't have that, even on the scales that we are, you can't, you can't go to Iowa and just grow corn. Or even they can't just grow corn. They have the soybean change. We won't allow Dave to grow four to six lettuce crops in a row, you know, and, and uh, as it is, the thresholds of the land are being, I think they're being, they've been pushed as far as it can go. When I started out at 600, 700 cartons an acre was the norm, and uh, they'd get a, they'd get a, a, a crop and a half a year. Now, Dave's under, uh, under two crops uh, in his rotation per year, but a lot of guys are two and a half, and, uh, and uh, when, you're, when you're getting that kind of production um, off, off the land year in and year out, you gotta really know what you're doing as far as your soil quality, uh, your compost. Dave, Dave has one of the best composting programs that I've been, been aware of. And, uh, you, you know, and, and as you looked at that map, the, you know, the, the soils are, are different depending where you are in the valley. If you're near, down near the, the uh, river, you, you have more of the alluvial type soils, and you get up in the hills, it's more of a sandy loam. And, or you know, so that all that factors into to how you create uh, um, a, a, a farming operation that, that's going to be sustainable. Um, last, uh, last night, there was a lecturer, Wes Jackson, who has a 50 year plan. You know that that, and he has his uh, his mandate that's going to change the the uh, the the landscape of agribusiness. And you know, it, it, it's it's a great vision. Doubt it'll ever get implemented. But that type of that type of uh, thought is out there, which is great. To, to, to hear that type of thing because it does focus on the integrity of the land. And, and when you look at agribusiness and the Walmarts and, and the Costco's on one side and the Monsanto's and the Archer Dan Midland on the other side, you know, they're, they're not an evil empire. They're just a businesses that have grown out of the, out of the, um, uh, out of the industrial re revolution that occurred roughly in 45, 19, 1945 to 1950. And you know what? They're, they're, they, they can change as rapidly as, as we can if, if the market will push them in that area. You, um, when it comes to organics, Monsanto has the largest organic seed production operation in the world, you know? So, um, and when, when that type of demand for those type of practices emerges from the consumer level, then, then, then it's all going to shift. And, and, and you know, my, my feeling is that organics will grow to probably somewhere between 10 and 15 percent of the market over the next 10 or 15 years. And that, that's pretty good growth. Okay, well, let's take one more question, then we'll take a brief break, and then we'll come back to asking some of these pre-prepared questions and getting uh, more of your questions as well. Ron? Uh, Ron, you want to? The mic? Uh, microphone? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, thanks. Um, I grew up on a farm in the Midwest, and it strikes me, you know, we're, it's interesting to see what you're all talking about in terms of uh, maintaining diversity on your farms, but it's kind of a, uh, a cultural amnesia. If you thought back 50 years ago or 75 years ago, what kind of diversity might have been in the Salinas Valley? And your comment that there's diversity in Iowa because they grow corn and then soybeans, 
When I was on the farm, it was corn, soybeans, alfalfa, oats, cattle, pigs, chickens, and now none of that is there in the last 25 years. It's a continually downhill slide in diversity on farming driven by, uh, I mean, I'm gonna throw out this comment that it's largely driven by government policies and industry responding to this growing in such a way that has such an overt control on the producers that, uh, you know, our view of diversity is shrinking and shrinking as we're going along. I guess I'm gonna throw that out there for you to respond to. You know, I'll, I'll respond a little. I mean, I don't disagree with that. But you know, 75 years ago, 35% of the population was farm raised. Now it's 2% of the population, barely. It's decreasing. When my father was growing up, he started working on the farm at seven years old with two by fours tied to his shoe so he could reach the pedals on the tractor. He went to school, he went to work at five o'clock in the morning, went to school at eight and came back to the farm at 3.30 in the afternoon and worked until dark, after dark. And so it, it, you, you have two generations that have moved to the city that didn't want any part of that lifestyle. And, and so whether it's government regulation or the, what I want to say, Madison Avenue about a change in, in desired lifestyle or work style, that has happened, and, and to go back to that, can you? I don't know, can you go back to it uh, to a certain point? I think so, it's there for people that want to do it, that want to make that lifestyle change or make that their lifestyle. But you know, it goes to, excuse me, government regulation. You know, I can't be within a thousand yards of any type of cattle operation because of food safety regulations. There is no science to that number. So I can't take 20 acres and put a pasture in like Dale would like to do and raise four or five beef cattle at the same time to get <clears throat> fertilizer and a rotation out of it and then put vegetables back in there in three years. It's not available in California or Arizona anymore to farm like that. It would be more of a challenge to do that, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well government policy I think is a driver for a lot of the grain crops and commodity things that are supported by that and maybe miss, you know, I think, Often farming is a lifestyle choice, just like ranching is, is not um, in the Midwest and ranching is here. It's not economically viable for many. It's mostly because they have the money and they can afford to keep it up or their family had it. And, you know, but if you look at the costs involved. And, and the thing I wonder about is you know, we're living in a bubble still it started to look like it was going to unravel a couple of years ago when fuel prices started going up. And this whole thing, you know, the only reason Salinas is uh, viable now is cheap fuel. You're able to ship it across the country. Um, they, you did, they started it with rail, now they're doing it with trucks. But it, when that changes, that whole thing's going to, there's going to be different priorities, you know. We were already starting to feel it when in 2008 when it was, you know, looking, we were looking at $8 a box just for freight to get it to the East Coast. And, you know, that, well, that's what the product is worth, you know, and makes, it gives a great incentive for local producers on the East Coast to do what they probably don't have, haven't had as much incentive to do in the past because California has been such a great place to, oh, you can count on it, you know, you don't have to worry about the weather there. But I think, um, a lot of these questions will be changed as soon as oil prices move up. Dan wants to Just quickly. Um, how far out do you um, forecast your capital investment? What's the last year on your spreadsheet? Mm -hmm. All of you. <laughs> yeah, I. I don't think he can forecast out, not with changing input price. And Dale's exactly right. Yeah. See, I can't. I'm not even willing to contract a set price for product right now based on for for three inputs: fuel and fertilizer, and labor. You can't 
budget that. I, we went from $2 a gallon diesel to $4.45 a gallon in eight months. And that was, that was the breaking point for economics in the Salinas Valley. It really was. $10 a box for transportation, which essentially doubles the cost of your product, um, wasn't viable. And that's why you see what is happening is regional and all this. There is a place for what was post-World War II America, which just came out of Victory Gardens, local home produce, still a lot of that. And it was pricing again that pushed all of that out. The ability, you know, you go to the Midwest, you, you have crop failures, zero return. It just happened in Florida right now. You had fish farms that froze, all the fish in, the, in ponds. You have all of the leafy greens that were being produced, probably 30,000 acres or more, that were essentially frozen with zero return in the marketplace. We don't get that in California. A crop failure here is 60% of production. And if you got 60% of production without market increase, you'd go out of business in one, in one year. So are you all just in one year? No, I'm 2016. So you actually, yeah. um, are you? I, I don't, I just keep paying, that's all. <laughs> 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 okay, we are going to take a very brief break. Uh, let's uh, meet back here in, in let's say, uh, 10 minutes. Because we have still a lot of questions out there in the audience, as well as some pre-prepared questions we really want to uh, ask our panelists. So please come back. Um, don't go away. Okay. So we're going to start off with this question here that I have up on the board. Um, which is the question I'd like to ask the panelists. Uh, what information or types of research would be most helpful to support growers in making informed decisions concerning diversifying their farming systems? And again, we're really thinking mostly about those farmers, those growers who are, have not adopted um, diversified, any kind of diversified practices in their farming systems, uh, what would it take? What kind of information might they need? Uh, what sort of research would you love to see us do, um, given that we're here at UC Berkeley, we do a lot of research, whether it's social, economic, uh, ecological. Um, we'd be really interested in your opinions on this. It could actually help direct um, the work of this group. Um, as we move forward in defining projects. So we'd be very, very interested to know what, what would you, what would you, information would you really wish you had and what information do you think would be useful to others? For me, the first thing, the biggest uh, uh, thing on the plate here is getting a uh, little sanity into food safety metrics and trying to um, put back in the box after it's been let out those kind of concepts of marketing that uh, discourage biodiversity and discourage, you know, hedgerows and grass waterways. You know, it, it really, the definition, uh, this was a poorly thought out, uh, you know, uh, seat of the pants attempt to try to control the market. And it, it wasn't, it doesn't serve anyone well. Um, it should be, if they, if there are unresolved food safety issues with salad, it ought to be specific to pre-cut bag salad producers and not people that are growing lettuce or cauliflower, broccoli, or the rest of the things. And that would go a long way to getting farmers and auditors to feel, to get away from this fear, you know, of liability. And so any kind of, I don't know how you do that exactly because it's, you know, it's a lot of fear-based stuff that's, but. Excellent suggestion, thank you. I, I think that's, that's critical, and I think we're going to have some serious problems if the government uh, agencies that uh, do this in, in the Congress and the uh, state legislators uh, continue to act in the same way, kind of a, almost a hysteric reaction to uh, some of these uh, health problems instead of the science-based. But uh, that, that's very important. From a small uh, farmer standpoint, those of us who are close to the urban core, uh, some of the things that uh, are, would be helpful uh, to us is to find new ways of distributing the uh, 
uh, the produce and also cutting down on the cost. For instance, uh, there's a local um, distributor here, a small distributor in uh, San Leandro. And I, I think what we're going to do is work out a, uh, an arrangement where when he delivers to one of the hospitals close to my farm, he's going to be able to go back loaded instead of with an empty truck. Uh, so uh, um, making uh, distribution systems more economical and uh, maybe uh, such things as uh, maybe a uh, uh, some kind of computer program that would uh, track different uh, vehicles uh, that are delivering uh, products. And, now this really only maybe works for in the in the Bay Area, it's not going to work for the larger farmers. I don't, their problems are a lot bigger than I can handle, <laughs> so I don't want to get into that side. But uh, that that would be an, uh, one thing to do. And uh, um, and I guess also uh, information on source identification. I think uh, the movement, uh, the food movement that has happened in the last few years, uh, people want to know where their f food's coming from. And now, while some of these food identification methods are for the health and, uh, and safety issues, uh, there's not enough information about uh, areas where certain products come from that are close to you. Um, so. Uh, and I guess this is more a little bit in the marketing side of, of things than it is in uh, in health, but I think information on you know how we can set up systems of identifying uh, local products uh, um, that that would be uh, a couple areas I would thought. Any any other thoughts or? Wishes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I like it. I like it when the um, when the research is uh, uh, prefer preferably uh, done in the Salinas Valley, like the the farm worker um, uh, health issues related to pesticides that uh, that's going on here. I think is very important. It's taking the research is taking place in in the Salinas Valley. So it's easy to correlate uh, uh, our pesticide <laughs> use to to that uh, that data sets, and um, um, so I think uh, the more the more we're able to access regional data, um, the better, because um, you know we're very different than the San Joaquin Valley, and we have a whole, whole uh, totally different in set of environmental factors. So. So, you know, but it doesn't mean research uh, should be precluded from taking one place <laughs> over here. But preferably, uh, but since we are dealing with ecosystems, you want to have a, uh, a, 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 a either, either take place where the data is going to be applied or in a very, uh, very similar type environment. So. Yeah, I'd like to just um, add to Dale, it is very important for the public and for the industry to, to increase diversity or farming techniques or anything, the, the food safety issue has to be settled in, in what is truly a, a scientific method and not a marketing reaction to satisfy perceived fears. Um, I think the second thing, there needs to be pretty good uh, research going forward um, on transportation, alternative transportation to trucking, because it, it is what spread everything across this country, but uh, it, it is, again, when fuel goes up to a certain point, it will not be a viable um, method of getting food distributed across this country or even exported. And so, you know, there has to be a better look at how rail comes back into production um, again and um, what combinations, and we were talking about it coming up, for rail even to be viable again, you have to build a whole distribution center again, a distribution system, because the terminal markets of the 40s and 50s where produce was shipped into a certain area in large municipalities and then shipped out into the city are gone. What trucks have allowed to happen is 
they become the local distribution center. So I have a load of lettuce that goes to Texas. They drop half of the load in Dallas, another part of it in San Antonio, and some more in Fort, Wor in Fort Worth. And so it gets distributed that way. There's no place for rail to actually function anymore in today's distribution. And so there is some research starting on that, but that whole system is going to change again in the next 10 years. It needs to change. Yeah, I think uh, Warren Buffett's investment in, uh, in Burlington Northern is going to really do uh, help uh, change that. And we will go back to the rail system. I can recall, we used to put uh, we used to put produce on, on a rail car for Chicago and sell it on its way back. You, you know, and so by the time it got there, we'd have a buyer for it, and uh, that that would happen a couple times a day. You know, where we just load up rail cards of unsold uh, produce. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. So I think we'll go on to the the last question uh, from the uh, that we have pre prepared, and then take questions from the audience. So this last question is a is a big one. Um, Let me look at it here. Uh, what types of adaptations are necessary to encourage more growers to adopt diversified farming system practices? We've kind of touched on this, but we're trying to get a little bit more specific here. Uh, we could be thinking about, and some of this you brought up just now in your, in your um, request for more information about things or more work on things. But for example, um, think also about term, in terms of farming practices, mechanization. We've talked about distribution marketing, um, particularly might want to think about federal, federal policy incentives, um, and also considering both those adaptations that would be needed for larger scale farms or aggregations of smaller en enterprises. That's a bit of a mouthful, but there's a the question. I respond initially the, with, um, th there are a lot of incentives on a federal level. That, um, some uh, equip programs, uh, NRCS, um, things that encourage certain practices, and uh, they have a um, varying reception with growers depending on the grower's personal um, outlook on on government f f money and the strings that might go along with it, but. Um, a lot of people were taking advantage of those and using them and implementing them, and there was uh, encouragement with the RCD, the Rural Conservation, the Resource Conservation Districts, and the NRCS to to get the word out to farmers. And uh, but a lot of that has gone by the wayside because the marketing issues with food safety have made the farmers more afraid of losing their market than um, having problems with an agency for you know that would come down on them for uh, water quality issues or, you know, lack of diversity on their farm or something, you know. It, it, in the case of organic, there's a mandate that you have some, you know, you increase biodiversity on your farm. Um, so I'm not sure how you structure that so that people are not, um, you know, m money you can, you can get, you know, you can make it uh, economically uh, attractive to farmers to do that, but if they're if they're worried about their main squeeze, their their main um, uh, marketing deal, then it's really hard for them to to get their attention, you know, uh, you, you know, to do those things that they know are good for the their farm and the environment. And so it's 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 a difficult. Um, other, other than the food safety issue, uh, is there anything that you would do to make those NRCS programs more accessible, more attractive to growers? Because I know, I mean, with a 50% cost share and, and with the degree of, of bureaucracy that's involved, some farmers just don't want to go there. Right. Yeah, the bureaucracy is an issue, and the, the, um, some of the, um, they've got, there's some good things they're working on that might streamline, you know, people that have, farmers that have, land that's next to a riparian areas that um, want to do something to improve those areas have to go through a whole slew of regulatory agencies from the Army Corps of Engineers to the Fish and Wildlife and Fish and Game and uh, you know there's a huge 
um, morass they get locked up in. And so if, you know, there's some direction certain RCDs are taking to help uh, coordinate that permit process, to, to streamline it so that they don't have to get each agency to sign off individually. Um, which, you know, and each agency has a slightly different take on it. So they're trying to, you know, so those things uh, take a long time. It's, there are bureaucracies that you're dealing with and, and you have to get the buy-in of boards of supervisors and the agencies themselves. So those things can help, I think. Um, anything to streamline the, you know, so there's very little incentive, even let's like, say farm labor housing, you know, we'd love to have farm a, a provision uh, on one hand for farm labor, but the, there are some onerous things that go along with that. And I don't really want to be a land, you know, a, a, a landowner is one thing to be a, a, a you know, a um, landlord. Landlord is, is a whole other thing. And I, I, you know, I'd invest something for housing, but I don't want to, you know, it's a, it's too scary to get, you know, you, so we don't. So I don't know how you, how you do that with, and keep everyone happy with, you know. Well, uh, Dale's right. The, the process to, to getting these type of things done has to be streamlined. And, but uh, assuming you can do it, um, there, the federal policy should be through uh, not subsidies, but tax incentives. You know, we don't want to be subsidized, but we certainly when we, uh, like when we put in the uh, tertiary water uh, uh, project, um, the costs are about a, at a $100 an acre foot premium over pumping uh, uh, well water. Well, that cost gets, it goes directly into the ranch. Well, that could be a credit back from, from uh, on a policy level or putting in uh, riparian buffers, uh, the cost that you do to put into that it could be a, put, could be a tax credit back. And uh, yeah, you just jump, uh, what scale of tax credit, if there were such a thing, a diversified farm <coughs> tax credit, at what point per acre would that be really attractive? Could you scale it? Yeah, I think you could, you, you know, you could start at, at, a, at a small, um, you know, base, say base uh, a acres of 10, and then just, and just go from there and, and scale it up because, because as, because uh, as the, uh, well, uh, as, uh, as a cost, as the acres go up, the, the cost uh, proportional to the acres should go down a little bit. You get economies of scale as you go up. So, so I think it would be scalable, and then you could, you know, you could you could have some type of ceiling where after after uh, I'd use 320 acres. Um, after 320 acres, then it it scale down to you get only 10 or 20 percent credit back for additional investments after that. Um, uh, but that's what, that's what they use for their excess land tax is 320 acres where we're at and uh, 960 acres uh, in the Midwest. So if, you, if you're on, a, on a, some type of federal project over those acre thresholds, you, you pay an excess tax. So you could reverse that and get a credit. One of the things that's held us back uh, sometimes are improvements that are made and then uh, it's added to the property tax bill yeah. and then it appreciates with the property, regardless if it's a, you know, if it's a well, um, which you'd think would eventually depreciate because it's a, it has a certain life and some have really long lives and some don't, but, you know, those things, um, not you know, those aren't pertinent to the conservation and diversity, but, it, you know, things that if you didn't have to worry about that, uh, then that landowners would have more incentive possibly to, to adopt these practices. Um, solar energy had, you know, I don't know if they still do, but there was a policy that any improvements of the solar, if you put solar energy on your house, you didn't pay the increased value of, you know, if the system cost $30,000 and it didn't add to your property tax base. And so that gave people an incentive to, on top of the, the rebate. So. Hey, hey, Albie, if you could bring up that uh, fence 
uh, along the river. This is a, this is a, an example. Uh, uh, food safety. We had deer in, in, a, in a field, so uh, we, uh, we were required to put up a fence, you know, along the Salinas River. That fence right there. Well, that that was a, that was a, that was in response to regulation. That was just cash out of the pocket on something that I didn't want to put up. You know, it was just done done to do it. You know, twenty two miles. Right? Tw twenty two miles long. <laughs> That's a lot of fence. So, you know, that was absorbed by the, by the growers, ultimately, or landowners. Landowners. Landowners, yeah. Yes, in the remaining time, um, we'd like to take your questions. Sabella, you wanted to ask a question? Uh, sure. Well, yes. Sorry. Okay. Is it a that. double question? Yes. Um, <clears throat> you know, first, when you were talking about Walmart, as I understand it, they're one of the major clients um, <clears throat> or supporters of NRDC's stewardship um, index, um, whereby they would have a more complicated look at exactly what diversity is. So in theory, I um, wanted to see to what extent they're sort of bought into these ideas with a little bit more complexity. Um, you know, because it seems, you know, on the economic upside, some, some kind of marketing piece needs to be built in. And I know things like predator-friendly wool and salmon safe for raspberries and so on and so forth seem to have sort of a limited market and it's sort of complex to imagine a um, diversified farming systems friendly uh, carrot. Um, so, um, but, but nonetheless, there's some attempt to standardize this so there is some kind of, uh, I'm not sure, certification or voluntary how that's going to work. But anyway, I'm sort of interested. I know you've been involved in this, Rob. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, I, I've actually I've sat on the uh, uh, on the working group for the biodiversity metrics for the stewardship index, which uh, uh, the stewardship index is is a, a response to the Walmart sustainability initiative, and um, it's it's totally voluntary. It's not a it's not uh, uh, regulation right now. It's just it's just benchmarks that are out there, and actually the um, the new company I started is to go out there and gather all those metrics and aggregate and, and provide uh, useful data for decision making. Um, and but ultimately, you know, uh, it, what I see it doing is is creating another uh, another segment of the market that's gonna that's gonna fall underneath organic. But above conventional, so if you if you're in compliance with these type of sustainability uh, indexes, um, you'll be, you, there may be a premium in there um, in with in the market. So, and um, but but you know on, on the whole it's good because it creates awareness and it, and it creates data sets and benchmarks and uh, oh, oh well, well the native vegetation yeah what are we doing with that how you know that's that that's all. Um, you know, just shining the light on it. So, when's that expected to come online? Um, they just had they just had their uh, their uh, coordinating council committee uh, meeting back in Washington on the 20th and 21st, and so I'd imagine it's going to be April, May. And and keep in mind, this is not a certification; it's just a guideline. So, so. We'll be used for marketing. It would definitely be used for marketing, uh, and uh, I think uh, companies like Walmart, uh, you know, I saw a study, if, if they just tamed the, changed the consumer perception that they were not only the low price, uh, uh, the lowest price retailer, they are also the leading in sustainability. It was worth $36 million in market cap to their business. So they have a big incentive to, to start uh, promoting that. Uh, within their merchandising network. Other questions out there? Thank you. Hello, I come from a farm state, Iowa, but <clears throat> I never did a lick of farming uh, at all. And I'm, you know, sort of interested in a general public sense of these kinds of discussions. And I was wondering what sort of, uh, you've answered my question somewhat in a, fr in a fragmented way, and that is what sort of rural social uh, relationships are emerging? Is there, 
Do people just sort of come and go and you learn a little bit from this person and that person? And I'm thinking through time also, you mentioned f having farm backgrounds in, in your family, uh, some of you, and then sort of you go out elsewhere and then return. And I was just wondering what sort of overall process, social process, is going on in, in agriculture, you know, in terms of hand me down knowledge, hand me down land, hand me down leases, hand me down practices, and, uh, and, and also laterally amongst neighbors and so forth. Is there anything solid that is emerging or is it just sort of floating? Thank you. No, I can speak in um, terms of um, the more um, organic marketplace, um, CSAs, um, farmers markets, these sorts of things um, that I think are uh, also a part of part of the uh, um, the locavore, you know, this concept of local um, product, and in I think most of at least uh, I know that recently I was um, asked to be part of a. Santa Cruz Farmers Group that has a bunch of, of, of graduates of uh, UC Santa Cruz Agroecology Program, and they um, have gained the basic knowledge of farming systems and and crop, you know, cropping and and this or you know, maybe garden to farm setting size, but they don't. They were missing the. Um, practical experience that you would get from a um, mentor or a an, you know family farm and you know in, in the case of wanting to know you know is do I need a, a one by two is that a big enough um, standard to use as an undercutting bar you know or do I need a one by three or you know so th these sorts of things aren't um, you know there all this knowledge has been lost because of generations that are um, it uh, I don't know how many, maybe Dave can speak to others, but the, um, uh, I didn't have it, and uh, you know, it's kind of just a school of learning by doing, um, trying to educate yourself by reading, and um, from my perspective that we've got, the, um, the kids are just I'm kind of interested in the farmer's market. We do a couple of farmer's markets, and we get the kids can get engaged with that. I mean, these kids, they're in their 20s now, or mostly 20s, 30s. Um, but there's nobody that really wants to take on, you know, I haven't made the farming life look attractive enough for anyone to really want to <laughs> join in, um, maybe on a sales level. Um, so, I, and I think with uh, conventionally, a lot of what I've heard is, um, there are a few people that stick with it that that it hands down to the generations and they learn this information, but oftentimes the kids want to do something else. And I mean, the, I think the average age of farmers is continuing to get, you know, it's 58 or something. That, that's, that's where the work that Sabella is doing is really important, um, getting rural, uh, urban, urban, uh, Urban kids, especially engaged in farming to any degree, is just just a very positive step. So, um, and and it's important. That's why I, I see the ben the biggest benefit of the local food movement is to get get people engaged in farming and and just not being a consumer to get them to understand the processes a little bit. So um, that's that's that's. It, that, that's a critical issue: is getting younger kids engaged. And I, you know, to add to that, I think <clears throat> we are losing knowledge generationally. It, it's going to happen because we are a decreasing population. I mean, I'm 50 years old. I don't know 10 other people my age, my kind of point in the in a generation. There's some younger people coming up in the 30s. My uncle on the other end of it is on his way out, but it's become so business oriented that it, it's not just about being a good farmer, it's the other end of it. And as companies get bigger, um, they're hiring in the, the actual farming part of it. And 
business end of it is dictating what gets done. And so it's a skill. It's, it, it is, for me, it's a marketing tool because I am still on the ranch every single day. It, you know, I don't have anyone below me between me and working and irrigators and tractor drivers. You go to a company even 500 acres larger, they're gonna have an irrigation supervisor, they've got a tractor supervisor, they probably got a shop going. As you lose your ability to be on the ranch and, can, and see it and make changes, it becomes more program farmed, which is less diversified because now you're specializing people in certain areas. And so you, you lose, as, as the farm population continues to decrease, we will lose knowledge. Um, we've lost knowledge, you know, but, but we gain. I, I mean, like Rob said, when I started for my uncle, the average uh, yield for lettuce in the Salinas Valley was 603 cartons. You know, I averaged 980 cartons last year. The potential is 14, if you, on the spacing and everything, ultimate 100%, it's 1,420 cartons. You know, that's the potential that's there. Do, do I think we'll ever see that? No. It, because the main thing that has to be remembered about the whole thing, it's, out, it's outdoors. You know, it's rained the last six days. What, what's that gonna do? How do you model a program to tell you what to do on that? And then you have three different types of soil. And part of his soil took all the water, and the other part is the lake. So, and those are things that came from generations. You know, it took me three or four years to figure out all of the little intricacies of the each of the ranches. And so every time you take on a new project, a new ranch, there are items that, that you know, the guy that farmed it for 10 years knows all of it. He knows which valve doesn't work, and he knows which corner of the field won't grow because it gets too much water. And so all those things are lost in transitions, or as you lose companies that go bankrupt because they can't, you know, they can't make it in the economic environment. So th those are all, I think, kind of hindrances to how we get more diversified because the, the tendency as you get bigger is to be more specialized. So um, we're kind of coming to the end of our time. We've covered an awful lot of ground and um, I think I'm gonna just uh, ask Rob, he's got a sort of closing remark or a remark that we're going to use as a closing remark. Um, and then we will thank the panel. Yeah, um, uh, Wes Jackson last night uh, uh, made a really, uh, uh, what I consider to be a, a, a uh, re reflective of his, his deep thinking, his genius. He, he said that, uh, that it's our high energy consumption that is destroying our cultural and biological information, which is constricting our cultural capacity. So that, that kind of sums it up. Okay, um, yeah, I think it's, it's difficult to summarize all the different topics that we've hit on, uh, but I, I really want to thank the panel for uh, bringing us the, the benefit of their experience and their expertise and uh, bringing us a window on something that many people in this room, since we're not growers, just don't get to see. So thank you so much, all of you, uh, for coming and...